All right, kia ora tato. Greetings to all of us. Uh, welcome, um, welcome to this uh, awesome event today. Uh, my name is Noah Romero. I am the assistant professor of Native American and Indigenous Studies at Hampshire. Uh, and we want to begin by naming that Hampshire College occupies unceded Nonatuck, Nipmuc, and Pocumtuck lands and waterways. We also acknowledge that Indigenous nations have entertained the empty words and gestures of invaders and opportunists for centuries, so it's important to continually interrupt processes that colonize and dispossess, including an in education. We honor and acknowledge the neighboring Indigenous nations, including the Nipmuc, Nipmuc and Wampanoag to the east, the Mohegan, Pequot, Skadikok, and Narragansett to the south, the Haudenosaunee to the west, and the Penobscot, Mi'kmaq, Wabanaki, and Abenaki to the north. With this acknowledgement comes a shared responsibility to work intentionally toward authentic engagement and good relationship with uh, the indigenous communities who are the rightful stewards of these sovereign and unceded lands. And I do not offer this acknowledgement as a substitute for active reparation. I offer it simply because I, as a Filipino person, was always taught that if you are a guest in someone's home, you take off your shoes and show some respect. Thank you. Hello, uh, this is Amy Jordan. And first, I'd like to start off by thanking the Common Read Committee, uh, which consists of Lily Kim, Amancita Moorhead, Zaya Waite, Natani Halaz. Um, this committee began thinking about the Common Read um, almost a year ago. Um, so it's really great to see this um, visit come to fruition. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, the Dean of Student Affairs Office, the Dean of Faculty Office, the Office of Justice, Equity, and Anti-Racism, and the Office of the President for the critical support they offered uh, to make this event possible. I would also like to thank um, particularly Andrew Yang and Noah Romero, who are new um, faculty to Hampshire and who really hit the ground running uh, and agreed, graciously agreed to work on this event um, pretty much as soon as they stepped on campus. <laughs> so I'd like to thank you both for that. So the Common Read is one of the first collegial conversations mm -hmm. that students have. Um, when they come to Hampshire, either as first years or transfer students. And when you get that letter over the summer announcing the common read, uh, you may have wondered exactly what's behind it. So I just want to say a few words about the common read as a project. While the selection of the common read has varied over the years, the books share some common elements. The common read often speaks to a larger set of urgent questions in a mode of inquiry and style of writing that draws us into contentious and highly relevant subjects. The common read books invite us into a conversation in which we are encouraged to consider how we locate ourselves in relation to these larger social transformations and often require us to embrace doing the close read, doing the deep history and engaging with these urgent questions in a more intimate way than we're used to. Some common read collections included Solomon Northrup's 12 Years a Slave, James Baldwin's Fire Next Time, Juno Diaz's The Brief Wondrous Life of Asuka Wow, Edwidge Dondekat's Creating Dangerously, and more recently, Grace Cho's Tastes Like War. These books share common elements. While they chronicle deep ruptures and displacements of human beings from specific geography, geographic places and communities. They are written from a deeply personal perspective and grounded in richly drawn lived experiences. Each writer has conveyed a compelling personal rendering of the broader impact of slavery, racism, settler colonialism, and empire. This year's Common Read was overwhelmingly chosen by the faculty and reflects the college's ongoing commitment to anti-racism and the process of repairing and strengthening our relationships with the land we, we are on in this college and with local Native communities. I would just also like to add how 
happy I am, elated I am that Robin Kimmerer is here with us today. Um, Kimmerer's work has truly been felt um, by various sectors of this community. It's been a center of conversation in our classrooms and our community education spaces um, and also beyond the college. Um, so I'd like to pass on to Andrew Yang, who will introduce Robin Kimmerer for us. Thank you, Amy. Yeah, hello, I'm Andrew Yang, uh, the Jonathan Lash Professor of Environmental Education and Sustainability here at Hampshire. And um, it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer. Robin is a mother, a scientist, professor, and an enrolled member of the citizen Potawatomi Nation. Much of her work centers on restoration, including not only the restoration of ecological communities, a restoration of our relationships to the land. Her first book, Gathering Moss, A Natural and Cultural History of Mosses, was awarded the Jonathan Burroughs Medal for Outstanding Nature Writing. And of course, Robin is also the author of Breaking Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teaching of Plants, as Amy mentioned, Hampshire's common read for this year, which has earned her very wide acclaim. In 2022, Breaking Sweetgrass was adapted for young adults by Monique Gray Smith, and this new edition reinforces how wider ecological understandings stem from listening to the Earth's oldest teachers, the plants around us. Her work has appeared in Orion, Whole Terrain, and numerous scientific journals. Robin holds a BS from Botany from SUNY ESF and an MS and PhD from Botany at the University of Wisconsin, and is the um, author, again, of numerous scientific papers, especially in the areas of plant ecology, bryophyte ecology, and traditional knowledge and restoration. Ecology. Kimmer is a, the SUNY Distinguished Teaching Professor of Environmental Biology and Founder and Director of the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment there, whose mission is to create programs which draw on wisdom, both indigenous and scientific knowledge for our shared goals of sustainability. I also would like to mention that in a, as of 2022, Robin is uh, also a MacArthur Fellow. Um, in closing, and just on a more personal note, I wanted to mention that I first came across Robin and her work through an interview that I read of hers in 2016 in a journal called The Sun. Um, and I've used this uh, interview called Two Ways of Knowing in my teaching ever since. Within that interview, uh, Robin says, the scientists peering through binoculars and the native hunter studying tracks in the mud both experience kinship with the living world. But there is one thing that concerns me, my students are more aware of humankind's negative impact on the environment than they are our potential for positive impact. When I ask students in my ecology class to list negative relationships between people and land, they can name all sorts of examples. It's clear to them that people and nature are a bad mix. But when I ask, what are the ways that humans can be beneficial for the land? They don't have much to say. This is dangerous. We need to consider ways humans can live that embody the concept of mutual flourishing that are good for both the land and for us. I think the talk tonight will address these early concerns. And so please everyone help me in welcoming Robin Walkimer. Thank you, Robin, for being here tonight. Miigwech, Andrew. Uh, thank you for that really nice introduction. I want to begin in our language and say, bonjour and dinoe maganadok. Hello, all my relatives. Shabadoski gish kokwe no deshmakas. Bodwe wad mi kwe endo. Megaze do dem, minwa mokbo do dem. My name is Shabadoski gish kokwe, the light shining through Sky Woman of Potawatomi, of the Bear Clan, and also of the Eagles. Shishibanyak ne ben de gues. I am enrolled in the citizen Potawatomi Nation in Shawnee, Oklahoma. And I'm really glad to be with you all here this evening. You can all see my slides, right? Yes? Okay, great. Just check in before we go forward here. Move them. There we go. Yep. Um, it is also our way in Potawatomi thinking that we acknowledge that gratitude is our first responsibility. And so I want to give my gratitude for the opportunity to be with you all here this evening as a writer, an opportunity to engage with readers, especially 
in a common read environment is really a privilege. So I look forward to our discussion, which will follow um, a, a little bit of um, things, a few things to think about together. Um, I also want to ground us in gratitude and remember that this morning, when we all first woke up and put our feet on Chukakwikwe, on Mother Earth, that we were given everything that we need. That first breath of morning air, a drink of water, sound of birds overhead. For me, it was a flock of snow geese coming by. The privilege of our work together, uh, beloved faces of, of our community. For all of this, we are grateful. And think about it in a way that as we offer gratitude for the land, that we live in such a way that one day, land will be grateful for us. I appreciate the land acknowledgement that Noah gave so beautifully, and to say that I am speaking to you today from Haudenosaunee territory. I'm Potawatomi Anishinaabe, but I live today among my Onondaga neighbors just over the back hill from, from where I live is Onondaga Nation, the central fire of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, to whom we owe an unpaid debt of land, of history, and certainly of this, in response to this evening's talk, of knowledge of how it is that we care for the land. But I want to give you an even bigger perspective of where we are. Um, what you're looking at here in this beautifully borderless map um, gives a, is a little bit of explanation about a Potawatomi Anishinaabe woman living here in Haudenosaunee territory. There is a very old relationship among our people. Um, the Haudenosaunee people, whose nations you see arrayed there across what is now New York State, and the Anishinaabe people share the eastern Great Lakes. And um, Long before settlers came here, we had to have agreements about how it is that we would live, live together, two nations in one place. And that is the Dish with One Spoon Treaty. So that you see this region was known as the Dish with One Spoon Territory. That Dish with One Spoon um, notion, the Nagan Gebejik Emkwan, um, is commemorated in this treaty belt woven of beads, sewn of beads of quahog shells. And in the center of that belt, you see the, the purple rectangle in the shape of a feast bowl. It looks so much like our birch bark feast dishes. And we agree with this belt that while we are two nations, we are both fed from the same dish. We understand that, that our lives are made possible by this land, that uh, Mother Earth fills a dish for all of us, and we have a shared responsibility to keep that dish full, to keep that dish clean. That's the meaning of this nagan, the, the, the dish. And in the center of that emblem, you also see a, a sign which um, is the spoon, and it is one spoon. It's basic emkwan. One nation, two nations, one spoon. This is a statement about sharing, isn't it? This is a statement, and I was asked to speak this afternoon, this evening, about justice. This is a statement about justice, um, of how it is that we will share and tend to the gifts of, of Mother Earth. And my Anishinaabe leaders have a copy of this belt in our lodges, and my Haudenosaunee neighbors have a copy of this ancient document in theirs as, as well. And you know, when we began with gratitude, it's important to remember that even though Shkokmikwe showers us every day with all these gifts of, from the earth, we, most of us, live in institutions and an economy which is relentless in asking what more can we take from the earth? But I think that question of what more can we take has us, you know, balanced on the on the tip on a tipping point, right? In the precipice of, of climate chaos and biodiversity loss. I think the question that we need is not what more can we take, but what does the earth ask of us? 
And because I know you've been reading Braiding Sweetgrass, you know that that is the central premise of the book, right? To ask us, what are the gifts that we can give in return? How do we enter into a reciprocal um, agreement with the living world? Because we know we have to. We know we're in trouble without reading this quote from, from the UN, the notion that sustainability itself for future generations is in question, which means maybe we should take a minute together to think about what we mean by sustainability. It's a term we use every day. You probably said that word several times already today. Well, a little bit of a story um, that for me is so revealing, uh, shared with me by an um, Algonquin biologist by the name of Carol Crow. And her story is that she was t wanting to go to a sustainability meeting. And so she asked her uh, band council, her tribal council, for a travel grant to go. And they said to her, well, what is sustainability? And she sort of laughed. She says, you know, that's how our people have lived well in place since time immemorial. But she also gave, the, gave them these different definitions, which are taken from textbooks and policies that I know you're familiar with. I highlighted in blue some of the things that all those definitions have in common. Um, let's just choose one, this living in such a way that we can ensure the attainment and continued satisfaction of human needs right? That's what we mean by sustainability. Well, she recounts that the uh, elders were quiet. They were kind of scowling at her, and she thought they were going to turn down her request. But they didn't. They said, you go to that meeting and carry a message with you. Tell them that sustainability sounds to me like they're trying to find a way to just keep on taking. It's not our right to keep taking. When your feet hit the ground in the morning, we should be thinking, what can we give? Do you hear a justice theme there too? The fairness, the equity of not always to being takers, but to understand ourselves, to remember ourselves as givers to the land again. And this is one of the challenges of our time, to overcome this characterization of human people as only consumers with negative interactions toward the land, and to think about how we might have a positive impact, how we might answer the question of what does the earth ask of us. So important is that question that it's actually an important part of our creation story. And you see Gij Kokwe here, the, the, the sky woman who was responsible for, um, ask, for enacting the answer to that question of what is it that we have to give. And what she had to give, the teaching that is in our creation story, is that the role of human people is to offer gratitude for the gift of all of the beings here on Turtle Island that made Sky Woman's life possible. They rescued her in our creation story. And that in return for the gifts of the animals, Sky Woman gave the plants. She brought with her all of the seeds and the fruits and the roots of the plants on the branch of the tree of life. You can go back and see that in her hand. Um, in return for the gifts of the animals, she helped to renew the, the earth and bring plant life there. That was her gift of reciprocity. So one of the ways we answer the question, what does the earth ask of us, is to give thanks for everything that has been given us and to return the gift so that the world keeps moving and giving. Because you all are reading Braiding Sweetgrass, I can't really complete an introduction without intro introducing you to Wingoshk, who you see here, um, these beautiful shining braids of, of sweet grass. And you know from the book that, that Wingoshk is a representation of the love that we have for Mother Earth. That's why we braid her hair. Sweet grass is understood as the hair of Mother Earth. 
And for the purposes of the book, the healing quality of caring for land in this tender way is embodied in those three strands, which for me as an indigenous scientist represent a strand of indigenous wisdom and teachings about how it is that we care for Mother Earth, a strand of scientific knowledge about how we care for the Earth. But both of those are human knowledges. And the third strand is the knowledge of the plants themselves, um, acknowledging that we view the plants as persons, as honored persons, and indeed our teachers. And because this is a student audience, I always want to share this next little bit of a story that I think you've read about, so I'll be brief. And that is that when I was going away to college, I had to think about the relationship between all these knowledges, indigenous knowledge, scientific knowledge, and the knowledge of the plants that are, and that story is told, of course, in Braiding Sweetgrass that you have in your hands, and I'm so honored to be in dialogue with you about it. My journey, I know that many of you are just beginning at Hampshire College, and my journey in going away to college was that I wanted to be a botanist. I also wanted to be a poet, but I was told that you couldn't do both of those things, and the plants chose me, so I went off to study botany. And um, infamously now, perhaps, um, you know, I was all ready for my freshman interview with my botany professor where he said to me, well, Miss Wall, why do you want to study botany? And I was ready. I was all primed for this. I um, said, I want to study botany because I want to know why goldenrod and asters, who you see here in this photo, uh, look so beautiful together. I had been a botanist since I was a toddler. <laughs> I thought I knew something about plants, and I thought this was a really good question that motivated me to go study at the university. But he said, my dear, that is beauty is not the sort of question with which scientists concern themselves. If you want to study beauty, you should have gone to art school. Oh, great. Day one. So I tried again. I also said, you know, I want to know why the plants make medicine for us. And I want to know why some plants bend well for baskets and others just snap off in your hand. And he said, that is not science. But tell you what, you come take my botany class and then you'll learn what science is. And that's why I look so happy. Um, <laughs> this is my freshman photo taken just hours after that interview. I thought that I must have made a mistake in my career choice and in my choice of school. After all, he was the botanist, and clearly I was wrong about what botany was. I felt like maybe I was knocking on the door of a club that did not want to let me in, that the way that I thought about the world was not welcome here. Have any of you ever had that experience of feeling at sea as if your ways of knowing just didn't belong in the place that you were? It made life really difficult for me when I was beginning my academic journey. And I didn't think about it at the time, but I sure did later about how my beginning of education had echoes of my grandfather's beginning of education at the Carlisle Indian School. You're looking here at one of those iconic photographs of children, native children taken away from their homes. My grandpa was only nine years old when he was taken to Carlisle Indian School, where their way of thinking was not permitted, their way of dressing, their way of speaking, their language, the beautiful ways that their parents had prepared them all was to be erased. This was the job of higher education, to assimilate, to replace one way of knowing with another. And I felt that too, as a young Native student alone 
in the academy. Because I had grown up on the land. I had really thought about the land through the indigenous lens of nature as subject, that the trees and the plants and the birds, everybody were persons. They were individuals. They were elders. They were teachers. They were my family. But when I got to study ecology at the university, this is what I was told the ecosystem looked like, that in fact, the dominant metaphor is, is the ecosystem as machine, not as family, not as, as community, the Western paradigm of nature as object. This philosophical difference caused me um, a, a, a great deal of, of uh, um, stress in trying to wrap my way of thinking around what I was being taught. I was in a college of natural resources. And so what does land mean in a Western context? I'm going to ask you to think about how you've been taught to think about land, how institutions around you are asked to think about land. And for the most part, in the Western tradition, that parcel of terrain below our feet is understood as property, isn't it? Meaning that you have exclusive rights to it. When you pay for it, you have the right to determine its fate. You could care for it or you could wreck it. It doesn't matter. It's yours. It's your property. Because land is also understood as capital. Land as sometimes ecosystem services. Little things like oxygen to breathe and, and fertile soil. And primarily land as natural resources. Which after all, what does that term mean? It means raw materials that we are going to extract and make into something valuable. That was the philosophy of a college of natural resources, where land is machined, land is object. But I had come from the indigenous paradigm, where land is understood primarily as our source of identity. It's who we are. We as people are inseparable from the land. Land absolutely as our sustainer, the ones who take care of us. Land as our home, but also the home of our more than human kinfolk, our relatives, which Western science calls biodiversity. Um, land as the connection to our ancestors and to the ancestors that we will become. Land as teacher, land as a source of knowledge. Uh, land as the library. Land is the pharmacy, the one who heals us with ills, spiritual, physical, emotional, because the land is inspirited, inherently, intrinsically valuable, because the land is our home. And we never think about land as a source of property rights. It's not that we claim rights to land, it's that you accept responsibility for land. And this is all wrapped up in the notion of the land as sacred. Which of these ideas most resonates with you? The Western colonized worldview? Or do you find some resonance in the indigenous conceptions of land as well? Do you think about land as a source only of belongings? Or is land most profoundly the, the source of our belonging to each other? and to this place. So as you think about the justice or the injustice in education around what it is that land means, I'd ask you to think about how your worldview has been colonized. What are the, what are the consequences of coming to be told that, that land is property, not that land is, is sacred, what are the consequences of the ways in which we have all been colonized in our educations in particular? And then we get to the question of justice. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to contribute to decolonization and the, and the revitalization of ancestral ways of knowing? I'm really proud to tell you that right down the hall from where my professor told me I should have gone to art school and that Indigenous ways of thinking were not welcome, we now have the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment. And our goal there is to help our students, our community, 
uh, more broadly speaking, indeed the, the the broader world, to understand the nature of erasure of indigenous knowledge and to try to help people put on a pair of glasses that has two lenses not just to focus our understanding of ourselves and the world through the lens of western science which is the predominant mode um, but to remember the lens of indigenous worldview indigenous science knowledge and and philosophy how much better equipped would we be to tackle these questions of sustainability if, in fact, we could look at the world with both of these lenses. And that is our work. It's a kind of, of educational justice work. I love this painting in response to the photograph of the children at Carlisle. It's a beautiful painting by David Fadden, and I love to think of which direction this painting is bringing us. Is this historical or is this a vision of the future? I choose to think of it as the decolonizing vision of the future of education, of which we are all a part. So as, as Noah suggested in his land acknowledgement, we have to go way beyond acknowledging history and the harms of colonialism to engage in what we what is called land justice, to contribute to decolonization of education, and indeed to elevate indigenous knowledge um, and and as as another lens on the world. And we're going to talk a little bit about those justice issues in particular. I'm often asked in my in my own work of, um, are you in this justice work of trying to reclaim indigenous ways of knowing, um, is that to return to an ancestral condition? And the answer is no. It's 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 to go forward, not to go back, but to to embrace the power of indigenous knowledge to expand our imaginations of different ways to live in the world that are an alternative to this idea of the land as commodity, the land as, as solely material. And, you know, we want to say, well, why is that important? As we say, we're looking ahead, using this knowledge to look ahead. I could talk all evening about that. I don't have all evening. So let me give you just one example that comes from this report from the United Nations, um, which I think of is, you know, it's not bedtime reading for any of us, right? You don't have this report on your nightstand, and you wouldn't want to because it is a nightmare. Um, what this is reporting on is the exponential loss of biodiversity all over the planet. It's heartbreaking. It's world-breaking. But there is a bright spot in this report as well, and that is that there are places on the planet, speaking of positive relationships between people and place, where biodiversity is not plummeting, where biodiversity is thriving, and those are in indigenous homelands. In indigenous homelands, these patterns are reversed. Shouldn't we, as learners, be asking why? When you look at a map of biodiversity hotspots around the world and then map the diversity of language onto it, they're almost one for one. It's so interesting that cultural diversity and biodiversity are linked. Um, again, just a hint of why that might be indigenous science, indigenous land management, the notion that human beings are not negative forces on the land, but we are integral positive forces for the land, that our tending, careful, mindful tending of the land actually enhances biodiversity, that we have to participate in the health of the land. It is cultural values that, that help underpin this remarkable finding that 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity is safeguarded by indigenous peoples. And so as we care about biodiversity, it means that we have to care and equally protect cultural diversity because in, in uh, 
continuation of colonial injustices, Native peoples have legal title to only 10% of the lands that they are stewarding. And those lands are under relentless pressure from a worldview of land as machine. And so the very future of biodiversity hangs on our understanding and willingness to engage with indigenous values, to ask what does the earth ask of us? There are so many ways to answer this question, you know, um, restoration ecology that has been evoked. We, the earth asks us to heal, to, to do regenerative agriculture, regenerative economies, um, to use good science and transformative art, to give gratitude. All of these are ways that we can give back to the earth. I like to say, what does the, the earth ask of us? Raise good children, raise a garden, and raise a ruckus on behalf of the land and no longer be complicit in its destruction. But this evening, I was asked in particular to talk about justice. What does the earth ask of us? The healing of justice. So let's just talk briefly about this before we turn to our own discussion and questions. You all know this famous painting of Manifest Destiny, of the ways in which settler colonialism um, in created the wounds on culture and land as colonialism attempted to replace indigenous lands, life ways, language, knowledge, spirit, and worldview with the worldview of the settler, the worldview of land as commodity, land as natural resources. The injustices that were that accompanied this and for native peoples and for the land are immense and must be acknowledged, understood, and collectively grieved and healed. Because we know that what is today called the United States was all a hundred percent indigenous homelands, and today our people live on just fractions of our original homelands, the injustice of dispossession and alienation from our, our lands has been profound. But what I want you to think about as we think about how do we heal those injustices is what were our homelands, what are still our homelands, how are they spoken of today? Met much of indigenous homelands are today under the umbrella of public land. You see various categories of public land here. And you know, this map is really um, kind of biased, isn't it? It shows all that public land in the in the West. And that's because um, the, this map of, of public land shows federal lands. Here in the East, where you and I live, a lot of our lands, our public lands are state lands, aren't they? Um, but a lot of it is also privatized. But basically what I'm trying to remind us all is that what we call public land in this, count, in this country, whether it be county, state, or federal lands, are in fact indigenous homelands. Those lands that supposedly belong to us as citizens of the United States are indigenous homelands, every single acre. What do we do with this injustice is the question for this evening. I put this slide in here because some of our Potawatomi homelands in Wisconsin, much of them are today called the Schwamagon Nicolay National Forest. These are our homelands, and yet they were made into Forest Service land. They were taken under the umbrella of public land so that the U.S. public has the right to harvest, enjoy, celebrate, educate on these lands, but not the Native peoples whose homelands those are. You probably know that this extends not only to things like Forest Service lands and Bureau of Land Management, 
But how many of you have visited national parks, for example, iconic public lands? And when we go and celebrate those landscapes, do we also remember that most of those landscapes were made into national parks through the removal, and often case, most cases, forced violent removal of indigenous peoples from parks and public lands. How do we address this land in justice where our homelands became public land for other people's enjoyment? What does justice for the land look like? Well, when we think about justice, there's a lot of ways to think about that term too, right? Is it fairness? Is it equity? Is it obeying the law? Is it morality? What do we mean by justice? So I turn not to Western notions of justice, but to Anishinaabe, Potawatomi concepts of, of justice in which, as you see here in this, this, this drawing, um, Justice is, is understood as harm which has been inflicted on, on an individual or a party of individuals. Um, where, but we, what we try to do in creating justice is to focus not so much on the crime or the offense, but on the relationship between the one who was harmed and the one who inflicted the harm, the offender and the offended. The wrongdoing is in some cases understood as an imbalance, a kind of illness, um, and that imbalance needs to be healed to restore right relationship between the offender and the offended. And justice is involved in personal and social healing through counsel, through change, and through gift giving, through reciprocity. This is a kind of healing by regenerating balance, which is known as restorative justice, right? So what does the land ask of us through a lens of indigenous justice thinking is restorative justice for land and for people. Let's look at this painting. It's an evocation of justice, manifest destiny in reverse. How do we enact that? How do we undo the harms of colonial domination of land and, and people? It's what this, this, this beautiful painting by Charles Hilliard asks us to consider. What would justice for the land look like? I hope we'll get to talk about that in a discussion in just a few minutes, but it could be restoration, healing the land. It could be rematriation, giving back to Mother Earth what has been taken from her. Could we create more protected cultural areas for practice of indigenous life ways? Could we engage with tribes, with indigenous nations in deeply meaningful collaboration over the fate and management and care for our homelands? We have many private land trusts in this in this country, where are the indigenous land trusts? Um, these are all ways that indigenous land justice might be enacted. So we need to move beyond land acknowledgement of historic land care and harm to think about healing. And in this regard, I want to quote David Troyer, who says, for Native peoples, there can be no better remedy for the injustice of theft of land than land, which brings us to the notion of land back. Here where I live in Onondaga territory, we are in the midst of, of enacting um, historic land back return of, of alienated lands to Onondaga Nation. And um, there are efforts to, to engage in land back, to practice land back as an act of justice emerging all over the country. And why not in your neighborhood too? Land back is one of the most profound acts of, 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 of justice 
or colonial harms that we can imagine. So I want to stop there so that we have plenty of time for discussion around these issues of, of land justice and, um, and the broader questions of what does the earth ask of, of us that are raised in embraiding sweetgrass and I suspect in many of the um, related common read activities that you've been engaged in. So miigwech bizandawiye, thank you for for listening. And I look forward to the, the, the questions and the discussion to follow. So might I just add something? There are some students in the main lecture hall, so there may be, um, Taylor might be able to write some of those questions into the chat from the main lecture hall, so, but just so that you keep that in mind, that might be coming from Taylor or Jamie. Um, yeah, miigwech, Professor Kimmerer. Thank you so much for um, such a generative and generous and thought-provoking and, and really rousing presentation that, um, um, you know, I did my PhD in New Zealand. I always talk about this concept called mana, which is the, the authority that one carries and cultivates through a lifetime spent um, in good relationship and in service to the people. And um, the mana just just spilled through every slide, every every word uh, of the last um, forty five minutes or so. And I I, I just really want to thank you for that. And um, and just to leave you with a, a note that um, you know I I'm hope I'm hopeful that you get your flowers as they're due. But just know that um, just through your efforts, our lives are enriched and ever grateful for them. Um, so we want to encourage anyone who is in attendance to throw a question in the chat for Professor Kimmerer. Um, and while that happens, I think, I, I guess I could get the ball rolling and then throw it over to um, Andrew, Amy, uh, Natani, any other panelists uh, who have a question. I, I, I guess my question is, um, um, so since we are now, we're we're in a situation where almost it's almost like um, extractive, racialized capitalism is is increasingly viewing land as as a uh, as an enemy, as an enemy combatant, as something that is hiding um, the riches from 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 us, the riches that we need to pursue um, capitalistic modes of progress. And you're seeing that with, uh, you know, Pahimaha out in Nevada, where, where they're blowing up a um, sacred site um, for lithium, lithium ore in order to power our greenwashed initiatives around electric cars and things like that. So we're creating a permanent scar on the land in order to pursue maybe 20, 30 years of, of luxury for, for a select few. And this is sort of the world that our youth are, are going to inherit. So I'd love to get your thoughts as far as um, advice for our students, for our youth, our emerging scholars, our elders in training. What can they do from where they sit to um, to work toward land back and decolonization? Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Well, the first the first thing that you have to do is is to educate yourself about it happening, right? Because there are so many forces around us that absolutely erase those messages. Uh, you know, you you invoke greenwashing, right? That certainly that, but but this this pervasive notion that our lives are going to be better if we consume more. You know, we need that lithium for, you know, more cell phones, more electronics. Um, I think that part of our the decolonization effort is to not be complicit in this hyper individualism and hyper consumerism. Um, if 
it, it relies on us adopting the notion that we have to buy more to be happy and, and, and you know, to think about the kind of gratification, enoughness, a culture of abundance that arises out of thinking about the land as pharmacy, as healer, as sustainer. If we genuinely believed and acted on the land as a living entity, how could we perpetrate the kind of extractions that you're talking about? about. We couldn't. Um, so that's why I always really focus on worldview, because we say, well, could 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 you or I stop that mining company? We can't. Um, but we can change how we think, and we can change about the way that, that we live. But us changing ourselves is not nearly enough, right? Because we are confronted by this huge scale of, of political, corporate, extractive worldview so we have to hold them accountable that's why i say you know raise good kids raise a garden and raise a ruckus we have to participate in resistance to that kind of um, request to be complicit in in destruction there's so many ways to do that um, but it begins with educating yourself it begins with voting it begins with changing your worldview to one of of enoughness rather than endless consumption. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, um, Robin. Um, so we've got some good questions in the chat that I think will allow us to um, to 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 build um, and be in community. So. Uh, I'm, I'll, I'll kind of combine them a little bit. So Zoe starts us off with, a, in a good way, uh, a little bit lighter of a question. She she asks, or they ask, uh, did you ever figure out why Goldenrod and Aster look so good together? Um, and then from there, how does Indigenous wis wisdom uh, and justice for land help heal the wounds of and from anti-Blackness? And that is from uh, an anonymous attendee. Um, so yeah, I'll let that land. Yeah, let's let's start with the the first question. Um, yeah, you know the the notion that that the beauty of the world is meaningless. You know that idea. Well, a beauty is just in the eye of the beholder. It turns out that the beauty, the eye beholding, <laughs> the golden rod and asters, is a bee eye, um, and and really is part of the power of the complementarity of those two plants is that they make a dazzling display of, of complementary colors that lights up our brains. Um, it really, really gets our attention. And it turns out that it's not only lights up human brains with that beauty, but it is deeply attractive to the brains of honeybees. Um, and so they actually um, respond to those complementary colors as well, which means that when those plants grow together, they are far more likely to have more pollinator visits, set more seed, um, and um, and contribute, and therefore be favored by uh, natural selection into the future. So beauty has um, it, beauty is not just the aesthetics um, of, of visual appeal, right? Beauty is also the functionality. Beauty is embedded in the reciprocity between those colors, the reciprocity between the bee and the flower. Um, it's a functional beauty as well as, as aesthetic beauty. Um, could you say this, the second question, Noah, which had many elements? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so that question asks, how does Indigenous wisdom and justice for land help heal the wounds of and from anti-Blackness? don't really know how to answer that question. I'm, I'm glad that it's been asked, and I want to, I want to take that question home with me <laughs> and think more deeply about it. But one of the first things that I would want to say about that is that the loss of land, alienation from land, is cuts across all cultural boundaries. Um, dispossession from land 
from our homelands is, is, is a deeply racist proposition that harms all of us. And to think about racism and environmental protection as separate things is a fallacy. They, they are all tied together through the lens of justice, of justice for land, justice for people. But I, I appreciate the question, and we'll want to think more deeply about the question of how, because I don't know how to answer that. Yeah, thank you so much. And I appreciate the uh, acknowledgement of how deeply interwoven and intersectional these um, not only the traumas are, but how, uh, the, the healing and liberation is. And I think that it's important to go into it with a, with a desire to proceed in a good way, more so than um, having the answer laid out um, before, before you um, start. And I think that's a, a very important um, bit of advice for a student. Um, some related questions in the chat. Uh, Annabelle asks, how can we as students help make change and what would that change look like? And after recognizing these issues, how can we address them through different scales um, on the local, regional, and national? Um, and a related question, this is becoming a big question, but I think I'll just uh, let them land and see what, what kind of gets activated. Um, what do you think is the primary thing that can be done here locally to help mend the break between, between indigenous peoples, non-indigenous peoples, and the land? Mm. I think that particularly where you all are in, in Massachusetts, um, I would want to encourage you all to be part of the thinking about land return, particularly through the agency of indigenous land trusts, which are emerging in, in New England. And the notion of there's the Native Land Trust, for example, um, under the, the leadership of Ramona Peters, um, which is all about um, returning lands to native stewardship and title to native peoples. Um, and there are also parallel movements to return access to lands for native peoples, not necessarily returning title in these cases, and this is often true in both public and private land, but returning access. Here in the Northeast, reservation territories, indigenous homelands remaining to us are tiny. And think about the fact that, you know, the, the cultural provisioning that people need, the plants, the animals that are integral to our life ways may not even be in within reservation boundaries. And so there is um, an emerging movement to enhance access to basketry materials, to foods um, on the land through land sharing, um, which requires good relations. It requires neighborliness. It requires engaging with one another in a at the speed of trust um, to, to enable that kind of land sharing. Because, you know, the, the berries, the maple trees, they don't care about property boundaries. They have gifts that are there to share with all of us. And so these, these cultural provisioning networks are a way to enact land justice um, that, that benefits um, all parties. So um, indigenous land trusts, cultural provisioning networks are a couple of beginning places that I know are happening in your region. Absolutely, thank you so much. And and yeah, I I I, uh, I guess um, just to inform our students, there are organizations locally who are engaged in um, rematriating land back to um, in, rightful indigenous nations. And there's all sorts of ways you can get involved. Um, there's the Lampson Brook Land Back Campaign that is working on rematriating land uh, here in. Um, Western Mass to uh, Nipmuc Nation, and um, there's all sorts of great stuff going, and I appreciate you um, reminding us of that, Robin. Um, are there any of our fellow panelists, do you all have any questions uh, that you'd like to pose to Professor Kimmerer? Yeah, 
Noah, while yeah. we wait on those questions, could I add one more thing, particularly mm -hmm. if you're thinking about um, local action? Here in, and this is something where, where colleges can have, and student participants can have a really important impact. Here in Syracuse, a few years back, there were some really important land rights issues for Haudenosaunee people, for Onondaga Nation. And what we encountered was that there was some, well, it ranged from um, disinterest to hostility around land issues here. And so what the community did, community led by students and faculty at, at, at institutions in Syracuse, put together an organization called Neighbors of the Onondaga Nation. And they all got together and said, we need to educate ourselves about our own neighbors, about our own history. And so this totally grassroots citizen effort put on lecture series. It, it lasted for more than a year, full, full lecture halls, as community members came to hear from a from an Onondaga leader and a, a, a non-native leader about the same issues. Let's 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 all talk about water. Let's all talk about lacrosse. Let's all talk about women's rights. Let's talk about environmental justice. And by the end of that year, oh gosh, thousands of people had been touched and educated about what does it mean to be a good neighbor to Onondaga Nation. Um, and the the outcome of that was a, was a real community support for Onondaga land rights. So that when Onondaga had to go argue in, in federal court around their land rights action, they were accompanied by busloads of citizens from Syracuse who wanted to say, no, this is not disruptive to our community. This is what healing looks like. And so that was a completely grassroots effort that I think is is just the can, can be really importantly led by university communities. Amazing. Thank you for that. Um Horero, that story. Um I, and it's such a powerful reminder that especially on or at least historically on college campuses and in the nearby environments, positive change has always been initiated and seen through by students, right? It's historically not the faculty or the administration that makes things happen. It is the students. And um, that's a prescient and wonderful reminder of the power that our youth really hold. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, Andrew, Amy, um, Natani, I don't want to monopolize the conversation too much. Do you all have any questions for Robin? Quick, I'm, I'm trying to, I think I want to share some of the ways that the, the book uh, has affected me in readings that I've been doing in the last year or so, is that a, a lot of um, speaking to that question a little bit about um, anti-Blackness, a lot of my research is, has been with um, farmers, Black farmers, who now have mostly passed on. But um, their struggle was often um, framed as a struggle for land ownership. And in African-American historical memory, the, that phrase 40 acres and a mule is connected to this idea of reparations in the form of land ownership. And I lately have been thinking a lot about um, the fact that a lot of that research was about knowledge of the land that people had developed, whether or not they ever gained land ownership. But um, so in their talking about their lives, they laid claim to that knowledge. But that land ownership was always the prize. It was always the goal, right? And so I think that this question around um, anti-Blackness in the US is deeply connected to that the fact that land ownership was always kind of <laughs> framed in that way, right? Um, and then, then I have to think about like the rise of, you know, community gardens and place like places like Detroit where it's re there's really been a dramatic resurgence as a way to kind of 
reclaim that kind of knowledge in relation to the land in a way that people thought was over, right? That 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 idea of having some access to land was seen as not possible. So that is sort of what I'm wrestling with. Thank you, Amy, for that. You know, it puts me in mind of thinking about like the the Northeast, what is it called? Me folk, the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust, um, which is really designed to to enact farmland reparation for for farmers of color. Um, to say, yeah, you know, cultivate the knowledge. Here is here is the land. It's land back for displaced farmers of color. Um, and that seems like a powerful remedy as well, to say nothing of the the, the policy shifts, et cetera, associated with those kinds of reparations. So thank you so much for shining some light on that. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I have questions, but I also am seeing a lot of really inter interesting ones in the, the Q&A students are asking, so I don't want to take away from that. So. I'm going to pass for just right now uh, in service of some of these really interesting ones from students. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, yeah, I have some questions here that I'm, I'm going to try to like summarize them according to themes. Uh, so students, I don't want you all to feel that I'm giving you short shrift here, but I want, you know, the the spirit and the thematic concerns of your questions to, you know, if we can answer them in in one go as much as possible and try for that in my wording. But um, I'm really intrigued by this question from Kadira and it feels weird exercising like absolute authority over what question get asked gets asked. <laughs> if I'm out of pocket, just send me a private message. But um, it does feel very um, important in a Don land context, you know, in a Massachusetts context where we only have two federally recognized tribes. Uh, so Kadira is wondering, what your input is on the efforts for indigenous stewardship on private land for indigenous communities who don't have land dedicated to their tribe, who don't have land um, held in trust. In the case of Mashpee, that trust land is you know, under, under threat as you were um, mentioning. And then building off of that, I don't know if we can move to a, a personal, do you have advice on how um, students might be able to um, you know, maybe practical advice on how students might be able to really restory their relationship with land and um, identify, um, you know, the the diversity that that is all around them. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, and I appreciate you have such a hard job of trying to weave these questions uh, together. So the first part of that question, um, I would again answer by thinking about um, these cultural provisioning networks and indigenous land trusts, because it is all about private land and about reclaiming um, title and access to private lands. So, um, you know, this is not only being done by the native land trusts that I had mentioned, but um, we are working in partnership with the Nature Conservancy right now here in New York State, who is really interested in these questions of land sharing and shared stewardship using indigenous knowledge with indigenous land caretakers. So from big organizations like, like the Nature Conservancy, working to incorporate indigenous stewardship to really hyper local land return and land sharing. There are lots of opportunities for you to get involved at, 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 the, at the grassroots level. Um, so there was that, and you know, now I answered that question. What was the second question? I'm sorry. Yeah, in terms of um, students sort of reconnecting with land. And if you're coming from a place where, you know, folks might have, might have grown up in New York City, you know, I see drone videos of Paris and see like, oh, there's no, the, the entire land has been entombed over there, right? There's just a tomb on top and on the bottom. <laughs> so mm -hmm. folks who may not have, that direct connection, what might be your advice for um, for rebuilding it, for, for re yeah, yeah. 
Oh, yeah, thank you. I love that that question and that you phrased it as restoring, um, because it isn't just about healing the land, it's about healing our relationship to land. So how do we cultivate that if we've come from um, a place of of alienation from the land? And, you know, first of all, I think we just have to um, unlearn the notion that nature's over there. Um, that we have to go out to some so-called pristine, there's no such thing, um, uh, landscape to have a relationship with nature. We can begin to build that attentiveness to to the living world in a in a really local way, you know, in an urban setting with 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 urban nature. They are just as profound teachers of reciprocity as as as, as something on the top of a faraway mountain. And for me, the the real restoring comes, first of all, from paying attention. Um, you know, our attention has been hijacked by corporate America. Uh, it has been hijacked to pay attention to what we don't have and what we're supposed to be buying. You know, this famous statistic of the average American school kid can recognize 100 corporate logos and fewer than 10 plants. Um, how do we begin restoring our relationship? We need to pay attention. And as every good teacher will tell you, you know, how, how do you learn? You have to show up to class, which to me means being outside, be where the teacher is, be in the presence of the teacher and to understand that the land will teach you. All it takes is attention. Uh, but that also means you have to slow down and be be mindful and give it the time that it takes. You know how we we all know that if we don't use a particular muscle, right, it's going to atrophy. We're going to become weak. We we won't be able to to you know exercise power because we didn't use that muscle. The same is true of the muscle of attentiveness and our learning ability from the living world. It's something to be cultivated. It doesn't come all at once. It's, it's, you, you have to be in the presence, pay attention with an open mind that says, not that that dandelion or that sugar maple or that, you know, robin singing in the tree is a thing. But what if you took seriously, this is my teacher. Oh. And that's such a, it's a gateway it's a doorway it's a portal to another kind of understanding so that i would say is where to begin is is to be trusting of the living world to teach you but you have to show up with humility and attention in order to be a good student i love that thank you so much it, it actually it's very validating to hear because uh, something i often have my students do as a as a homework assignment is to uh, is a two-part question. One, find a place where the land has survived where it shouldn't have. And then the other one is to find a place where, um, uh, or sorry, recognize that water is always trying to go home to the sea. Find a place where you can help water do that. Um, and I I always, it just sounded cool to me to do. <laughs> but never really unpacked like the deeper um, significance of an activity like that. So I appreciate that answer so much. It's, you know, it's, it's the advice to students is to pay attention, um, be vigilant and, uh, and don't skip Andrew's class. That's, that's the main, that's a key take. <laughs> if we could turn a little bit to like a professional development sort of, um, um, tact, uh, we have a couple of scientists in the chat who um, certainly stand on your shoulders, but also know what they're getting into as folks who are bringing um, radical, critical, decolonial worldviews into um, into the uh, Western like STEM um, field. So a question from Hallie is uh, if you could, oh, let's start with uh, Zia's question. It's, um, you seem to have some bad experiences with Western science. What has pushed you to continue using some of its understandings in your work? And to follow up from Hallie, if you could pinpoint one moment in your career where you knew that your efforts were making a difference, what would it be? And do you have any advice for students trying to maintain hope, pursuing careers adjacent to plant biology? Yeah, um, let me start with, with sort of that beginning of, of working with a foot in both worlds. 
right? Um, uh, and and so that metaphor of braiding those knowledges together is a really powerful one because to me what what that reminds me of is that those strands of the braid don't become one another. They are distinct. They are sovereign, but they can work together to create something powerful and beautiful. Um, but they're not becoming one another. We're not talking about homogenization or assimilation of, of, of knowledges, but, but really understanding the qualities of each of them so that we can use them well. And what I try to tell my students is that Western science gives us a great toolkit, right? And you can employ the tools out of that toolkit to answer questions that come from the indigenous worldview. Um, you know, Western science isn't just about, you know, answering the questions, it's asking the questions in the first place. And so as we ask questions about relationship to the land and to our more than human relatives, why not use the tools of Western science respectfully, guided by indigenous responsibility for knowledge to answer those questions. It's for me this separation between the tools of Western science and the worldview. And what I try to do is to employ selected tools of the of the of Western science in service to the indigenous worldview. And and that's what that's what makes sense to me. And to the question of when did you feel like you were making a difference? Thank you for that question. I can think of so many junctions along the way from asking the right challenging question as a graduate student to um, professional um, times when I thought they're listening. Those folks who have been dismissing our knowledge for so long are listening. Um, and I will say that probably to answer your question in a way that was really useful to students um, is the places where I have had the most impact, I think, are places where I've brought my whole self to science. I've published plenty of peer-reviewed technical articles that were all within the Western worldview. But when I chose to step out of that and bring Indigenous ways of seeing the world, bring Indigenous philosophy and my own um, gifts that were given to me as a seer and a writer, that's when I had an impact is when I wasn't trying to fit in to anybody's expectations of me, except for the expectations I had for myself of how can I be a whole person, bring, bring the poet and the scientist together, bring the indigenous framework and the tools of Western science together. And that's where I felt that I had an impact. And so for so many of us, a lot of our education is profoundly assimilative. It tells you, these are the expectations of your field, of your discipline. This is how you move forward in your, in your discipline. It's good to know those things. Those are the rules of, of, of the game, you know? It's really important to know the rules of the game so you can undermine them <laughs> and break them um, later. But first, you have to learn them. But first, you have to learn them. So, um, yeah, I, I would say bring your whole self to what you do. And that's where you'll have the most impact. That's wonderful. Thank you, Robin. Um, uh, how, how are we on time, Amy? Before I, before I you know, pop off for too long, uh, how are we doing? Um. We're we had, we're ninety minutes, so oh, okay. we're up ten minutes away from seven o'clock. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um. All right. I guess we're let's let's keep going till the wheels come off. That's what I always. That's how I. <laughs> kind of go. 
that's where I'm coming from. Um, yeah, I just appreciate that so much, Robin. I think it's such a powerful reminder and message to um, our young people that it is okay to show up as your whole self and those different strands of what constitutes the the wholeness of, of ourselves are multiplicative and generative and um, and they help one another. It's not that we have to reduce one part of it in order to um, to fit in um, to fit into a dominant worldview. And um, it's a simple message, I suppose, but it is uh, it's hard to to do in in real life, right? Um, so I appreciate you um, reminding our students of the the responsibility to show up as their whole selves in whatever space they inhabit, and to remind them that if you care about doing botany or or um, biology or optometry <laughs> in the way that you've described as a as a way of honoring uh, indigenous life ways and worldviews, you are doing the right thing, um, and continue to be vigilant about how you do it but keep doing it. Uh, that's such a powerful framing. And I appreciate you bringing that into this space. Um, so a question from Finn, which I believe um, dovetails nicely into this last question. Um, is how do you view the movement toward ruralism in younger people who cannot afford to live near centers of capitalism? Is, I guess uh, we're, we're thinking like living off the grid, living in, um, tiny homes and, and communes and things like that. Is it an opportunity for better community with the land or more settler relationships with indigenous people or, uh, or even like appropriation of indigenous um, knowledge? Is it an opportunity for further colonialism, consumption and gentrification of the earth? And how do you encourage people to reconnect with the land in a respectful and decolonial way? Um, and we're really interested in this at Hampshire. We're moving toward decolonization and reciprocity and right relationships with uh, local and regional and neighboring indigenous communities. So um, I guess pairing these two questions, um, what do you think of these sort of off the grid movements um, and how might whatever you think of those movements inform how universities um, go beyond land acknowledgements and just like kind of pat alternatives to extractive systems. I hope that braids together. <laughs> I'm just I'm <laughs> going. Yeah, there are about a hundred questions wrapped in there. Let me see what I can do. Um, Anything's good. I, I think you know the notion of simplifying our lives, of restoring our relationship to land through ruralism, through moving off the grid, through simplification and therefore deepening of our lives and our relationships with our neighbors and with our more than human neighbors as well is, is deeply admirable. Um, there's, you know, I, th I think you just, I'm, I'm hoping you're all reading Wendell Berry, um, you know, the gift of good land. Um, It's a way of enacting our principles, isn't it? Of, of, of localizing our economies, relocalizing our economies and our relationships. Um, so all to the good. And that as universities help pair folks for that work, it's really, really important. But it also strikes me that given the urgency of the crises that we face collectively that that has historically had some overtones of escapism of not engaging in the political arena in the economic arena because we don't we, we don't want to engage with that kind of thinking but how then do we decolonize it how do we dismantle it if we're not engaging with it and so i think that's the the key is to think about how does the impact of our individual life choices to live simply on the land, how do, does that intersect with justice? How do we make that available as a, as a viable choice for others? And how do we do it in a way which is 
still politically um, influential. Um, and that, that seems very important in the urgency of our time because we live in a time when we know what to do, quite honestly, about climate change. We have the technology, we have the policy, we have the money, we have all of these things that we need to solve this problem, but what we don't have is the political will. And I think that it feels the urgency is in helping to develop that political will to, to change our collective story. And so I would just urge that the ruralism, uh, the rewilding in a sense of ourselves and our, and, and our communities not be at the expense of, of activism and engagement. They seem like they need to be complementary. Okay. Uh, Andrew, did you want to um, pull something? I don't want to put you that, but you. It should. was just. It was really funny because I was actually going to ask about nature conservancy specifically, and so this, in response to the student question, you addressed it um really well. But I maybe I could follow up just to say um. Are there other organizations that work in the space of like land conservancy like that, sort of NGOs that you also think um, do well in trying to uh, engage indigenous communities in land stewardship? Yeah, and I think I've, I've, I've mentioned several of them already. The Native Land yeah, Trust, Native um, land Trust being a really important one. Um, Northeast Farmers of Color, um, mm -hmm. I think is is a is an organization that that I admire. Um, um, in a similar vein, um, there are local flourishing of chapters of, of folks who are interested in the rights of nature. I know mm -hmm. that there are many in Vermont, for example, um, and the rights of nature as a philosophical movement that then translates to political will and, and municipal action to declare the recognition of the rights of a river or a mountain or a wetland. These are... Um, there, there's, you know, it, it's a whole system of international jurisprudence, but it manifests at the level of localities of people mm -hmm. recognizing that inherent right to be of, of, of local landscapes. And that's another way I think that we can um, engage these, these, mm -hmm. these issues of land justice, of, of, of conveying, recognizing the inherent rights of nature. And this isn't so much a I mean, it's kind of a question. I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to puzzle through it myself, but I, I feel like you might know uh, something about this topic. You know, there's certainly a, a move to also use, for example, um, the preservation of lands, especially biodiverse spaces, as a way to also do carbon offsets, right? And all these other schemes to sort of um, monetize, <laughs> unfortunately, and right, make financial. Uh, certain kinds of relationships on on one level that are supposed to address, say, a planetary concern, within those that end up, of course, impacting local people. And I, uh, I'm of course, as many are highly skeptical about a lot of the ways these things operate. I just want to know if you had could share anything you knew about. Um, it doesn't have to even just be necessarily indigenous perspectives from North America, but again, this tension. And conflict between like, well, you know, if you want to do right by climate change, then it's about p perhaps um, this kind of um, acceding control for certain kinds of land, because it has to be managed in this kind of way, not that kind of way. And so just, you know, reflecting on some of those tensions around and, and, and you know, conflicting priorities around these different scales of concern. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um... And you know, while I tend to advocate for so-called nature-based solutions um, for for carbon sequestration, plants know what to do, right? But we have to do it in a good way, in yeah. a, in a way, you know, in the the notion of 
it's, it's happening all over the world of displacement of indigenous and local peoples for carbon st storage in right. that notion that we have to, that people can't be part of, of the solution. Um, mm -hmm. And there's, there's a lot of international agreements, you know, arising around this, this tension, right. Um, f of, of land rights that 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 can't be in conflict with with carbon sequestration initiatives, carbon markets, man, I don't I don't, I don't know. It's <laughs> it's I I understand the the impetus as a as a quicker solution, but I think there's a lot of a lot of danger and untested assumptions about right. our relationship in there. So mostly, I guess what I would just echo, there's a, lot, there's a lot of questions to be asked here, but that it must be tied to justice and to the, again, to the recognition that people living in nature, with nature, applying Indigenous knowledge and, and worldview to the land has been shown to help the land flourish, not removal of people from the landscape in order to have a, um, a, a monocultural plantation of uh, trees that are going to be really right. fast sucking carbon. Growing, down. fast growing, yeah. That's where also I really appreciated you sharing in your talk that part about, you know, Indigenous lands are the ones in which, you know, there's the, the highest level of biodiversity or lowest level of biodiversity lost, right? That these forms of stewardship really help maintain, of course, the things otherwise, um, you know, people are trying to, to quote unquote, solve, right, um, by other means. So, I mean, it's really valuable to have that perspective um, have and just have this clear information that like, here here's the data, you know. Well, and also that notion that that this kind of land-based practice has to happen in somebody else's homelands. Um, you know, we're right. you're always displacing this. You know, yeah. I was flying over the Midwest last week, and you know, here it is in the middle of winter, seeing all of this cropland with no cover crops. On. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, just raw <laughs> soil. Raw soil. Look at yourself. You know, you you don't have to impose these solutions on other people we have those solutions and they they simply need to be incentivized and acted on mm -hmm. no i mean i think that's what's so powerful about everything you said today is this idea of displacement physically of course as place right and, and um the way that people are completely disenfranchised but then also like you know conceptually we're always trying to find some other place to put that to offset right um those those damages and so i mean that's where i think the placidness and the, the you're talking about the right relationship with land is just so meaningful because then i think people immediately reconfigure oh well what is the the real cost to this <laughs> right it's actually a cost to me it's to uh, um but and, until you know until we stop those displacements i think you know people aren't confronted with those those facts yeah yeah. I think, okay, I think it's a good time. Um, I'm sorry to end this, um, but I I can't thank you enough, Dr. Kimmerer, for um, yeah, approaching this talk and these questions with your heart. And um, I think the students really appreciate it from the questions the opportunity to engage with you. And um, and I know all of us here who have um, worked on this event are very grateful. I also, I forgot to thank Taylor Ortiz for being the tech person and who quickly changed everything around um, yesterday because we were having this big snowstorm coming. <laughs> so Taylor, thank you for helping to support us through these shifts. Um, but um, thank you, thank you, thank you. We've been we've been wanting you to come for a long time. So thank you for making the time and and uh, so graciously engaging with us. Great. Well, thank you all. It's been a pleasure. Mm -hmm.